so you could spend all your time doing it. It's a glorious day. <laughs> well, it's been my enormous good luck, just born in the right time, to have had, to some extent, those childhood ambitions satisfied. I have been involved in the exploration of other worlds in, in the most amazing science fiction sense. We actually send spacecraft to other worlds. We fly by them, we orbit them, we land on them. We control the robots and make them do things, dig and it digs. Determine the chemistry of that and it determines the chemistry. And uh, for me, the, the continuum from uh, childhood wonder and uh, early science fiction to uh, professional reality has been very smooth. It's never been, uh, oh gee, this is nothing like what I had imagined. Just the opposite. It's exactly like what I imagined. And so I, I feel enormously uh, fortunate about that. And science is still one of my chief joys. The popularization of science, the communication of not just the findings but the methods of science, seems to me as a result uh, as natural as, as breathing. I mean, after all, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And so the idea that, uh, that scientists uh, shouldn't talk about their science seems to me bizarre. Now, there's another, just speaking personally, another reason why, why I think popularizing science is important, why I try to do it. And it's a foreboding I have, uh, maybe ill-placed, of an America in my children's generation or my grandchildren's generation when all the manufacturing industries have uh, slipped away to other countries, um, when we're a service and information processing economy, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest uh, can even grasp the issues, when the people, the the people, I mean the, the broad population in a democracy, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or even to knowledgeably question those who do set the agendas, when there is no practice in questioning those in authority, when clutching our crystals and religiously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in steep decline, unable to distinguish between what's true and what feels good, we slide almost without noticing into superstition and darkness. That worries me. And I don't think that uh, we have adequate protections against that. I don't think this is just a, uh, a kind of uh, fantasy. Uh, there are reasons to worry. And you will recognize that uh, Psychop plays a sometimes lonely, but still, and in this case the word is right, heroic <laughs> role in trying to counter some of those trends. We have a civilization based on science and technology. And we've cleverly arranged things so that almost nobody understands science and technology. <laughs> Now that is as clear a prescription for disaster as you can imagine. It's a combustible mixture of ignorance and power. And while we might get away with it for a while, that mixture, sooner or later, is going to blow up. The powers of modern technology are so enormous, I'll mention in a minute an example or two, that it's insufficient to, uh, to just say, well, those in charge of those powers, uh, I'm sure, are doing a good job. This is a democracy, and for us to make sure that the powers of science and technology are used properly and prudently, we ourselves must understand science and technology. The predictive powers of science, some areas of science at least, are, are awesome. And they are the clearest 
counter-argument, I can imagine, to those who say, oh, science is situational. Science is uh, just the current fashion. Uh, science is the promotion of the self-interests of those in power. Surely there is some of that. Surely if there's any powerful tool, those in power will try to use it or even monopolize it. Uh, surely scientists being people grow up in a certain society and reflect the prejudices in that society. How would we imagine it to be, to be different? So scientists have been nationalists and scientists have been racists and scientists have been sexists. But that doesn't undermine the validity of science. That's just a consequence of being human. So imagine so many areas we could think of. Imagine you wish to know the sex of your unborn child. Now there are several approaches. You could, for example, do what uh, the late film star, who Annie and I both admire greatly, uh, uh, Cary Grant, did uh, before he was in acting. And that is, in the carnival or fair, suspend a watch or a plumb bob above the abdomen of the expectant mother. And if it swings left, right, it's a boy. And if it swings forward, back, it's a girl. And he got it right one time in two. <laughs> and of course, he was out of there before the baby was born, so there were never any, uh, any uh, angry customers who said he got it wrong. And being right one chance in two, that's not so bad. I mean, it's better than, say, Kremlinologists do. But if you really want to know, then you go to amniocentesis or to um, sonograms. And there, your chance of being right is 99 out of 100. It's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than one out of two. If you really want to know, you go to science. Or suppose you wanted to know when the next eclipse of the sun is. Science does something really astonishing. It can tell you a century in advance where the eclipse is going to be on the earth and when totality to the fraction of a second. Think of the predictive power implied in that. Think of how much you must understand. To be able to say when there's going to be an eclipse so far in the future and where on the Earth. Or, and it's essentially the same physics exactly, imagine launching a spacecraft from the Earth, like the Voyager spacecraft in 1977. And 12 years later, Voyager 1 arrives at Neptune within 75 kilometers of where it was supposed to be, not having to use the mid-course corrections that were provided, 12 years, 5 billion kilometers on target. So if you want to really be able to predict the future, not in everything, but in some areas, there's only one aspect of human scholarship of human claims to knowledge which really delivers the goods and that's science. Religions would give their eye teeth to be able to predict anything like that well and think of how much mileage they would make if they ever could, could do predictions like that by any method other than science.